The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This is just beautiful country. Why wouldn't you want to spend your time down here doing this cool thing? They have a great time out here. We'll start early in the morning and go way beyond the traditional school class hours. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman. I'm your host, Brett Amundsen. This week, I'm learning how to fly fish down in southeastern Minnesota at Whitewater State Park. Then we'll visit a trout hatchery to find out how these fish are raised and then transported into rivers and streams where they don't naturally reproduce. We'll follow some stream ecology students as they stock some of these same trout into the Redwood River. All that and more on this episode of Prairie Sportsman. Funding for this project was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by American Surplus, Ice Castle Fish House RV, Minnesota's largest manufacturer of premium portable ice fish houses, and a proud supporter of the annual February Ice Castle Classic Fishing Tournament. More information at icecastlefh.com. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. More at LiveWideOpen.com. Today, we find ourselves down in southeastern Minnesota in an area known as the Driftless Region. It's called that because this was an area that the glaciers missed. So that left us with high bluffs and cool, clear running creeks and rivers like the Whitewater River here that's next to us. I'm gonna learn how to fly fish. I don't know how it happened, I've fished my entire life, but for whatever reason, I never picked up a fly rod. And when you have an area like this, kind of right in your backyard, you have to try it out. So we're gonna go after some trout today. I'm gonna learn how to fly fish with Mike Alwyn, who's been doing it for a long time. So I uh, wish me luck. Mike Alwyn has been teaching fly fishing lessons since 1980 and owned Bob Mitchell's Fly Shop in Lake Elmo for almost 20 years before retiring in 2013. Before we headed to the stream, Mike taught me two types of casts, aerialized casting where the line leaves the water and anchored casting where the line stays on the water to load the rod. The most common is the roll cast. So your key position is gonna look like this and your roll cast is gonna look like that. Okay. Slowly lift that rod. Key position, nice. Now drop the elbow, make the cast. Good. Good, try it again. Okay. Now the key here is to get it up here so that line can come back and form that D, right? Yeah, you want that thumb vertical. The, the D loop has to be behind your shoulder. Okay. Okay. Drop the elbow, make the cast, good. There's your roll cast. You got that, Brett? Oh, oh, there we go, fish on. How's it feel? Um, it's a nice fish. So here we are, five minutes into fishing here at Whitewater, and you hook into a fish, and I thought we'd be catching mostly browns down here, but what do you got there, Mike? This is a rainbow trout. Looks like about, oh, 9, 10, 12, 12 inches long, about a foot. Nice pink stripe, dark stripes on the, dark spots on the top. Beautiful fish. And I'm gonna to try to cover all of this water between me and that far bank. And at this point, I can't cast far enough, so I'm going to have to a little more line out. And this is how you shorten it, just like that. Here you try. Come out here. Get a natural drift. Nice cast. 
a little short, but yeah, I didn't quite go where I wanted it to. But... Don't you hate when that happens? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now let go of the line on your rod. That's it. Throw some line into that riffle, but try to stay out of the tree on the far bank. A little bit wider strokes. That's it. Okay, now roll that upstream. Good, nice cast. Keep the rod tip up. Up. <laughs> uh, Rock. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I got all excited too. Yeah, <laughs> dang. <laughs> Remember, the rod tip is what directs the fly. Or directs the fly line. The fly line is always going to follow the rod tip. You want it over there? Point the rod tip over there. We moved upstream to a shallow, rocky area called a riffle, where fish hide out in the pools. See how the water comes around? Like, if you go way up to where you can see the water break this way, mm -hmm. and then it breaks this way, and then it gets down to this run, and it breaks that way, okay? So most of the food is going to be concentrated from the middle of this creek to that bank. Now this is where all the food is produced, and these chunks are hiding places. They're right. called lies, and that's where fish like to hang out. They'll hang up in that deeper water, too. I've heard of a lot of lies when it comes to fishing. Well, yeah. It usually involves <laughs> the size of the fish. Yes. There is much more to the art of fly fishing than learning to cast. Reading the water and tying on a fly that matches what the fish are eating is fundamental. Most of the people that I know who like to fish really like to fish dry flies. And a dry fly is a fly that's designed to not penetrate the surface. But trout only feed on those mayflies or caddisflies on the surface about 10% of the time. The rest of the time they're underwater making a living munching bugs off the bottom. So we fish on the bottom. Lots of times these, when these insects emerge, most of them swim to the surface. So we use a wet fly to imitate that. And a wet fly is just a, a fly that has some motion in it and it's cast downstream and it swings to the surface. When we fly fish, it's a very athletic process, but it's really um, a limitation that we put on ourselves. If the idea was to catch fish, to go home with a boatload of fish. There's easier ways to do it. Whether you're fishing with a worm or a, a minnow or whether you're fishing with uh, a stick bait for bass or muskies or something or whether you're fishing with flies it's, or a MEP spinner. It's just a, uh, a different you're, limitation. Ultimately, you're challenging yourself to some extent. Oh, yeah. yeah. How's my lesson going so far? Am I figuring this thing out? Yeah, you're doing fine. Do you have confidence that we're going to see me catch a fish on the show? No. <laughs> Great. No, no, those are two separate questions. <laughs> Mike was right. I had a fish on the line, but I didn't land it. However, fly fishing isn't something you learn in an afternoon. Those with a passion for the sport never stop learning. I got introduced to this in 1972. I had a friend who was in the Air Force and he was stationed in Great Falls, Montana. And he said, come on out, we'll go fishing in the Rocky Mountains and backpacking and we'll fish for trout. And I grew up fishing, you know, throwing hardware for bass and pike. I had no idea what a trout was. So we went out there and he was the only one with a fly rod and I watched him cast, and I watched him catch fish, and I thought, I missed something. There was nobody in those days to learn from. So you had to do it on your own. You watched a, p a few people, and you read some books, and after three years, I was so demoralized, I took a fly fishing course in West Yellowstone, Montana, 
And then I started catching some fish and I was just entranced by the whole thing. I was the first person in the Twin Cities to start actively teaching people an organized system. And I, I kept working at it and getting better and better and better. It's taken me 30, 35 years to get to the point where my casting curriculum is pretty good. Ask him. The reason you choose to fish with a fly line and a fly is because it's interesting. There are tons of things to learn. The last time I counted, there were 600 species of mayflies in North America. Over 1,200 species of caddisflies in North America. Thousands of species of midges in North America. Well, that's just a ton of stuff. It's interesting to learn. You see what I mean when I said that it was a, it was an athletic pursuit. Sure. It's not, um, it's not the same as fishing bait. It's not the same as throwing, uh, you know, plastic worms into the lily pads or, or uh, bulrushes. Um, here you are out on a creek. Nice surroundings. You never know what's around the next bend. You look upstream and you think, geez, I wonder what's up there. It's just cool. It is. The surroundings, I think, are, are half of it. Seeing a landscape like this, I mean, it, it doesn't get much better than this. And uh, I like a challenge. I mean, I've, you know, I've fished for a long time and never fished like this, and it's definitely definitely a challenge to it, an art to it, a finesse to it, and uh, that's fun. You know, that fish may not have been very big, but it's fun. This is, this is just beautiful country. Why wouldn't you want to spend your time down here doing this cool thing? My name is Stephanie Fell. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the Candioi County Task Force. The important thing about aquatic invasive species is you need to remove them from your watercraft because if you even get a fragment of Eurasian water milfoil into another body of water, that fragment can grow. If you get just a little bit of water into another body of water, it could contain uh, juvenile zebra mussels or villagers, and those could grow into a new population. Run your hand along the outside of your boat. If it feels sandpapery, that means that you do have small zebra mussels that are starting to attach. So it's very important to get that decontaminated. If you're unable to decontaminate your boat through visiting a decontamination unit or um, using high pressure wash or high temperature water, it's important that you dry that boat for at least five days. Docks, boat lifts, anything of that sort of permanent nature, that needs to be out of the water for at least 30 days before that goes anywhere else because it, that, that's more likely to be much more in, infested. And it's just such a difficult thing to remedy once it's in a lake. So we all can play our part to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. This segment has been brought to you by the Aquatic Invasive Species Task Forces of Big Stone, Candy, Ojai, and Yellow Medicine Counties. There are five cold water fish hatcheries in the state of Minnesota. We travel to the one in Lanesboro in southeast Minnesota where fishery specialist Troy Lejeune gave us a tour of the impressive facility that raises rainbows and brown trout with spring-fed waters. So this is kind of the, the heart and soul of the hatchery right here, isn't it? Yes, this is our main spring, spring one. We also have another spring that comes off the back of the hillside. But this one facilitates most of our, our hatchery right here. So all the water that gets used here comes out of the side of this hill right here? Yep. <laughs> it's, we get up to about, about 5,000 gallons a minute. Wow. And majority of it comes from this one. It's always 48 degrees because it's spring fed. And uh, it, it helps out because it's got a lot of dissolved oxygen in it. So this water 
then runs through a system of pipes that goes everywhere around here, and it's, it all flows downhill. It's all gravity flow. They, uh, they built up the spring so it's up high enough that it can travel without pumps to get to our raceways and our ponds. Saves you a little bit of money. It saves us a ton of money. Spring water sustain all aspects of the Lanesboro Trout facility, which starts with good brooding stock raised in large ponds. They're pretty good size. Yeah. They're probably between, uh, I'd say, six and eight pounds. Uh, broodstock is actually the parents. They'll be the, the males and the females that we spawn, where we take the milt or sperm from the males and fertilize the female eggs to create more for our production. And you keep all of those together, males and the females together? We keep males and females together a lot of times, but when we spawn them, we take a younger male, uh, like a three-year-old male with a four-year-old female. And this is because when you got all, all threes and all fours together, if you spawn them together, there's a chance of incest. So this is why we want to keep our genetics as wide and diverse as possible. <laughs> egg incubation room. Um, this is a, a heat stack. What we do is we have the eggs in it, the water comes in through the back, comes underneath, goes through a screen, upwells through so they get their oxygen, comes out the front, circulates in the back, and then drops down to the next tray. In these, these stacks we have eight trays and so we can use four gallons a minute of water to facilitate uh, hundreds of thousands of eggs. How long do you keep eggs in here? Eggs will be in here for, for 30, usually about 30 to 36 days. Um, and that, at that time, they'll be hatching. We'll bring them into our nursery and let them hatch in there. So after the eggs hatch, this is where the fish go? Yeah, we bring them into our nursery here. And we, we actually have smaller tanks that set up on the top so that it's easier for us to, to handle. But once they grow up into the, to fingerlings like we have right here, we drop them down into our, our bigger tanks, what we call super troughs, and uh, we grow them up in here until they're not able to, to be in here anymore because of density reasons, and then we take them out into our raceways or our ponds. We have the red lighting mainly for our brown trout because they're very wild and skittish. So when it's kind of dim in here, we can still see and we can work with them, but it doesn't bother them as much. So what we have in here right now are our rainbow fingerlings. These are our fish that were in our nursery, but they got too big to facilitate in those tanks, so we have to bring them out to a bigger tank or raceway. So we bring them out here to grow them up a little bit larger before they then end up into the pond. So the water coming out of these pipes is coming from that waterfall, that spring that we saw. And there's no pumps here. This is literally just gravity and the force of that water making it shoot out of there? Yep. It's the head pressure from that spring being so high, it forces the water down through the pipes to then come up this high and then feeds these raceways right here that we have some rainbow yearlings in that we're going to stock tomorrow, actually. So these fish, after they leave here, get stocked. So realistically, these are the fish that are going to Camden. Yes. Yep, we took one of these raceways that had brown broodstock and we hauled them in our transport and hauled them over to Wyndham and Candom State Park and Ortonville. Well, this is, this is pretty cool with all the, the ponds and, I mean, you got the fish and you got geese, you got the, the bluffs up there. This is a really neat area right it's, here. It's beautiful down here, you know, from buildings to other buildings to the, the Root River, bike trails. Very scenic. I can think of worse places to live. Yeah, I like work. it here. <laughs> <laughs>
But the DNR has found streams in other parts of the state that can support trout during spring and early summer months. Every year they stock a few streams in southwest Minnesota with full-grown trout raised at a hatchery in Lanesboro. We went to Camden State Park to see DNR Area Fishery Supervisor Ryan Dornboss and hydrologist Lucas Youngsma, who are releasing a semi-load of trout into the river. I don't know, this one. Usually once a year, it's in the spring, uh, we bring about 2,500 uh, brown trout uh, to Camden State Park, and we stock another 450 in Sheldorf Creek by Wyndham. Um, those are two streams that typically have cool enough water for a certain period of time um, till midsummer that has the temperatures that will support trout, brown trout specifically. It's not meant uh, necessarily to be a sustainable fishery as much as it is to create a unique fishing angling opportunity for anglers in southwest Minnesota. The DNR had help from students who had taken a stream ecology class at Southwest Christian High School in Edgerton. Oh, there's a tank. Oh, it's so exciting. They enthusiastically <laughs> brought nets brimming with trout into various spots along the river. Five years ago, uh, teacher Greg Dyke from Southwest Christian in Edgerton contacted DNR about uh, working with their students here in Camden State Park on the Redwood River to do projects to promote uh, conservation, habitat improvement, and so on. They have a great time out here. We'll start early in the morning and go way beyond the traditional school class hours. And there's never a complaint, regardless if uh, students uh, get splashed or get wet, regardless of the weather. Go wait for that first person to fall in. <laughs> you almost jinxed it. It's just a fun, fun time with a tremendous amount of learning opportunity that they otherwise just would not have the opportunity to get. I didn't really know how much 2,500 trout looked like. It was quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. Oh, they're alive! <laughs> Depending how many fish they put in the net, it was either really heavy and you had to use a lot of your arm muscles or they weren't too bad and you could just ease them right on into the river. Sometimes you just stick the net in and they just knew what to do and just swam right away. Other times they were trying to go against the net and they didn't quite want to get out so we had to kind of pry them out of there and let them free. We had to be careful while we were walking in the river because the fish were still dormant from being stunned. You didn't want to step on them so you had to shuffle your feet so you didn't step on anything. I've appreciated the water and nature a whole lot more taking this class. Hopefully I can uh, apply it to some of my future jobs as I'll hopefully be majoring in biology and could lead off into something like this. Getting students, getting uh, the next generations involved in uh, just being aware of the resource, uh, being outdoorsmen, being fishermen, um, that provides just so much uh, support and encouragement for me in what I'm doing and why DNR is doing what we do. The Redwood River can support these trout because of the area's geography. We're sitting near the Coteau, which is uh, an area of raised elevation. And so all that water, as we all know, water tends to fall uh, and through gravity. And so what happens is a lot of these, uh, these lateral movements of water are, are beneath us quite a ways, obviously, and have cooler temps, but they're not truly spring-fed streams. But that colder water creates the environment that these streams have cooler temps for you know, a certain period of time. Back in the day, years ago, they measured, started measuring water temperatures in these streams, and they found that both Sheldorf Creek and the Redwood River had cool enough water for an extended period of time that they thought it was adequate enough to stock trout. And it got enough recognition over the years that it, it created kind of this niche that anglers really wanted to fish trout. There's not a lot of areas uh, where you have lots of public access to streams like this and, and uh, other than going way to the southeast. And this is a a great opportunity that anglers can come into Camden State Park and you know walk up and down the stream and fish certain pools and catch trout 
and, and have a good time. I know the conservation officer in years past have, has documented 100 anglers on opening day. So that's what we're after is, is anglers to come in and utilize the resource and, and have a good time and enjoy the outdoors. You asked and we listened. I'm Amanda Anderson, digital media specialist for Prairie Sportsman. The Q&A section of each episode is powered by questions from Prairie Sportsman viewers. This week's question. What benefit comes from grazing cattle on conservation land? My name is Greg Oak. I'm the Prairie Habitat Team Supervisor with the Minnesota DNR. Before settlement, free-roaming bison would have grazed an area and moved on, possibly not returning for several years. Conservation grazing usually seeks to mimic those patterns. Bison and cattle primarily eat grasses, opening up the plant canopy and allowing for a greater diversity and abundance of wildflowers. The analogy I like to use is prescribed fire. The day after a burn, there isn't much nesting cover, but it's crucial for the long-term health of the site. Generally, we try to pull cattle off mid-summer so the plants have a chance to regrow during the second half of the summer, providing cover through the winter. When done carefully, grazing has ecological, economic, and societal benefits. However, we can't emphasize enough. We can't open every conservation acre to grazing. Grazing should be done only where and when it can help meet management and ecological objectives for wildlife habitat. Thanks for asking. Email questions to prairiesportsman at pioneer.org or use hashtag AskPS on Facebook and Twitter and visit our blog for more Q&A. Thanks for tuning in to Prairie Sportsman and be sure to get outdoors this week. Funding for this project was provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources and by American Surplus, Ice Castle Fish House RV, Minnesota's largest manufacturer of premium portable ice fish houses and a proud supporter of the annual February Ice Castle Classic Fishing Tournament. More information at icecastlefh.com. And by Live Wide Open, a regional movement that encourages people to make a great life for themselves in West Central Minnesota. More at livewideopen.com.